we. Um, we are on, um, let's see, get in there. There we go. Okay. We conclude today chapter one of the third book. We are speaking about tshuva, penitence. This is Igeris tshuva, the epistle of penitence. Will um, teach us how to get closer to God in many layers. So, what have we learned till now? The other Rebbe quoted from Talmudic teachings from the Abraisa that says atonement comes in different colors or different brands, different ways. For a positive commandment, if you do tshuva, penitence, tshuva, you get atonement right away. If it's a transgress, if it's a transgression of a prohibition of the Torah, then you have to wait until Yom Kippur. It's not enough tshuva. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, will bring you full atonement. And then there are transgressions that carry a very heavy punishment with them, whether it's excision, meaning being cut off from heaven and the like. Um, then you need to have tshuva, Yom Kippur, and you need also some kind of suffering that you will go through pain in this world. That's a brief what we explained yesterday. The Altered a bit now quoting from Maimonides says that the mitzvah of tshuva what is the command? What is, we, is Aziva Sachit Bilvad? Is leaving the path of transgression of sin, of that negativity. Um, that's what it is. But what does that mean? It means making a resolve that that particular sin that I did, not only I won't do that sin, but I accept upon myself the yoke of heaven. In other words, that I am here to serve. I'm here to do what God wants from me, what he needs from me. Not just that particular sin, but a, a general acceptance of God, the yoke of heaven, and with that then comes the yoke of mitzvahs, of the commandments that God wants me uh, to fulfill. And um, in other words, ready to serve him, you know, and observe the commandments. That's what tshuva means. Uh, in other words, we're prompted by something that we did, uh, that we failed, rather, that we failed, and that uh, prompts us to um, return. And we have that kind of concept. It says, let the wicked abandon his path and the sinful his thoughts and return to God, do tshuva to Hashem. Uh, verses in the Torah that bring out this idea that we need to return to Hashem with all our heart and, and so on and so forth. Now, there is a popular misconception and that is that a part of this or an integral part of this is fasting. That you need to fast in order to do tshuva, in order to do penitence, in order to return to God. And the author just categorically says that that's not the case. It's not the case even when we're talking about sins that are punishable by suffering. So you might say, well, I'm going to get suffering. I'm going to take the suffering on me. How? I'm going to fast. Uh, by the way, my thought on this is, the author doesn't say this, but in this day and age at least, why would people make that mistake? Well, maybe because their connection to Judaism is, you know, three days a year on Rosh Hashanah, two days, and one day Yom Kippur, which is a day of fasting. So it's a day of fasting. It's a day of returning to God. So obviously fasting is an integral part of tshuva. No, it's not. Fasting does not have what to do with tshuva, even if it's self-infliction to mitigate the inf or to bring upon the infliction that I'm supposed to get if there's as we mentioned 
uh, we want atonement for certain sins that were severe that come with a punishment of excision. No. Why not? It's because that pain that we go through is not self-infliction, has to be carried out by the hands of heaven. In other words, uh, when we have a pain in our lives, suffering in our lives, we should actually, and uh, the Altair doesn't say this here, but I'll add, um, be aware that this is coming to bring some kind of an atonement. And we should be aware of that. And you know, there's actually a Sephardic custom uh, uh, um, that people would say, kapara, kapara. Uh, this is an atonement, like, you know, something happened, uh, you know, uh, you lost something, you, uh, uh, you know, there was a fire or something got destroyed in your home or whatever it is, and it's, it's painful, and it's coming from heaven. So you would say that this is, or be at least aware, and again, some people have even the tradition to say uh, that this is my uh, kapara, my atonement. <coughs> But the point is that it's not fasting, which is self-infliction. If there is to be an infliction, it is from the hands of heaven when God will decide on what it is to be uh, in our lives. As uh, the verse says, that God chastises those that he loves. In other words, a person did tshuva, has returned to Hashem, and it's not sufficient. God brings some kind of uh, pain right, in their lives. And with this, and we can understand how Maimonides and all of the codifiers of Jewish law do not mention fasting at all with the mitzvah of tshuva, penitence. Now, we just explained that the, the mitzvah is about leaving the path of sin, transgression, accepting upon yourself the yoke of heaven and fulfillment of that which God needs from us, fulfillment of the mitzvahs. The, the um, codifiers add that we need to verbalize, which is called vidui, verbalize that which we have done wrong and the acceptance, uh, leaving that, and the acceptance of um, returning to Hashem. So there's two components in the mitzvah of tshuva at this point. Two components are that we had pleasure in something that was sinful. We gotta leave that. We had pleasure in that, that which we had pleasure in, we should be pained. We should be pained by that, and that's what penitence is, is uh, an earnest regret, right? And. Uh, an earnest regret of what we did. That is the spiritual side of um, of tshuva, meaning in the sin there was a spiritual component and a physical component. The spiritual component is the pleasure of sin. So we have to have the regret of sin, leaving that, the regret. The earnest regret, right? Then there is the body of the sin, which is the act itself. There's the act itself and the pleasure in the act. So, just as there is the act itself, which is the physical manifestation of the sin, there has to be the physical manifestation of the tshuva, which is verbalizing it. That's called vidui. So those two components. Okay, now the Alter Rebbe says, however, if we look in the Torah, we do find the concept of fasting that uh, one should fast, as the verse says in the book of Yoel, return to me with all your hearts and with fasting and weeping. So there is a concept of fasting that seemingly is connected with returning with tshuva. So the Alter Rebbe explains, no, it's not about tshuva. Tshuva, penitence, is about something that we did in the past. Something in the past that we need to fix. 
God gives us an opportunity that we could fix the past. We could mend. We could heal. That's tshuva. In that, there is no fasting. There's no mitzvah of fasting in order to heal the past, in order to return to God and to have atonement. However, this, and in other areas, is speaking about the future. Meaning, there's a decree upon you, the Jewish community, or whatever, a decree in heaven. And in order to annul the decree, then fasting has a place. But the future is not about penitence. The future is about a decree, something negative that is... Um, to occur by the hand of heaven, and you want to know that decree. What's a good example of that? The story of Purim. Purim, there was a decree from heaven that was expressed through Haman, Haman, who wanted to destroy the entire Jewish people. And Esther told Mordechai, make, a f- make three days of fasting, and I too and my maidens will fast, and all the Jewish people will fast in order to annul a decree. And fasting, of course, is a part of annulling the decree. It's not the only part, but it's a part of it. Likewise, if there's a drought, there's a whole um, tractate in the Talmud, Tainus, about fasting. Tainus means to fast. And it's speaking about drought, in particular in the land of Israel, and uh, what it means to annul the decree, and part of that is through fasting. But again, that has nothing to do with penitence. Tshuva tshuva is about some ill that we've done in the past, and we want to make amends for it. We want to cleanse the slate. We want to have atonement. That is azim sachet bilvad. That is about leaving that path, taking upon ourselves the yoke of heaven, and recognizing that we're here as servants of God to fulfill that which he needs from us. Um, we, will, we see in the Musa well, classics that speak about the concept of numerous fasts, and self-mortification, and so on and so forth. Um, and these, again, are not about the concept of tshuva. They are a concept of sometimes if you don't are not capable to have a complete atonement, so uh, that can help in that area. Actually, in the next chapter, we're going to go further into this idea um, that we will separate between the concept of tshuva, penitence, which it's... Uh, desired end is cleansing the slate, kapara, atonement, and uh, another concept that um, tomorrow's class we will learn about. So I think we might even have some questions over here. I appreciate your questions, by the way, so don't be bashful. First of all, let us say hello to Diane. Diane, rather. Diane from Dublin. Oh, very nice. Jotha from Brazil. Good morning. Ona from uh, Iowa. Joseph. Thank you, Joseph. Joseph, remind me where you're from. Oi. It's like on the tip of my tongue. Paulo. Shalom. Laura from Nashville, Tennessee. Boker Tov. Uh, Hilio, thank you. Muhammad, thank you for joining. Marilyn from Delaware, thank you. Oh, Paul from San Antonio, Texas. Thank you, Freddie. Uh, Annie, thank you. Cindy from Florida, Boca Tov. David and Batya are with us. Thank you. Deborah, shalom. Gianna, thank you. Um, don't we fast in Yom Kippur so we can leave the physical to concentrate on the spiritual? We don't focus on our body, but on the soul and its connection to Hashem. 
and our deeds. Very good, Denise. Um, yeah, a deeper level about Yom Kippur is fasting is not about a deprivation, even on a simple level it is, obviously, not eating, right? On a deeper level, it is that who needs to eat? Who wants to eat? Who can eat when you're on such a lofty level? If you're like a soul, like an angel, right? Angels don't eat. So we wear white because we're so, so soulful like angels. We're on such a, a level of spirituality. Who could eat? Who needs it? As a matter of fact, the fasting is invigorating. That's a higher level of Yom Kippur, absolutely. And it, it, to enhance our connection with God on that day. Very good. Very true. Uh, Sigalit. Okay, thank you. She has greater clarity now. Wonderful. Annie from Costa Rica, good morning. Nitsan from Romania, thank you for joining. How many hours a day should a person fast? Intermittent fasting if you're on a diet. <laughs> um, we will discuss this in the next couple of chapters more about this. We're not finished the topic, so stay tuned. Ella from Arizona, thank you. Tim from Texas, Letty from San Diego, and that's it. All right, thank you for the uh, good comments and good questions. Folks, we are uh, just finished the first chapter, so it's an opportunity to get new people involved. Bakasha um, Nafshis, a personal request, and that is, I need your help to get this far and above and beyond the viewership that we have now. Wonderful that we have every day. Um, definitely a few hundred people that are watching if you know the um, the whole broadcast at least uh, a, a large amount. But it's far from where it needs to be. It needs to be um, a lot more. So I need your help by sharing of course the class but uh, getting the word around and let, letting people, uh, giving them the opportunity to engage. All right, folks, I'm Rabbi Ronnie Fine coming to you from my home in Montreal, Canada, where it's a privilege and a pleasure to share with you the time you have. Have a wonderful and good day.